Hello, hi everyone. We're having a slight interoperability and language problem. Um, it thinks I'm French and it wants to change all the characters on the keyboard, but um, I think we've got it working, so we'll just start in a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for a few people to show up. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, we'll just uh, get going. We were waiting for one speaker, but we assume with the distance between rooms, he might show up in a second. Um, so we've got a really, really great panel, and I think this sort of started out of our fear that all of the narratives start with Terminator and end with Terminator. And we were getting really bored of seeing really old science fiction dystopias inform the way we discuss AI. And we felt a lot of it didn't even make sense in a lot of Asia where although they may have watched the same movies, their interaction and relationship with that kind of pop culture is sort of one level removed from local pop culture, which actually, given that a lot of Western culture derives from Japanese anime and all kinds of other imaginations of robots and futures and utopias, we actually thought it didn't make a lot of sense to just keep on and on beating the same narratives we hear everywhere else. Um, so we started working on this um, last year and we were really interested in making it a very interdisciplinary conversation because as you can imagine in Asia technology drives a lot of the conversation around new technology. Um, it's the techies that actually have a stranglehold on the conversation. Policymakers kind of come second whether they do or don't understand the technology and everyone else, especially the humanities, come way, way behind. So we really set out to change that. Um, so we've got a great bunch of people who are going to help us sort of unpack those kinds of tropes and storytelling. Um, so I'm going to start from the other end. We have Jack, who runs the women's rights program at APC, based out of Malaysia. We have Danit Gao, who is based in Beijing, um, who is a Yanqing scholar at Peking University. Um, and she's also on the IEEE AI Ethics Initiative. She's the outreach chair and doing a lot of work um, in China, Japan, and Korea. Uh, we have Vidushi, who is with Article 19, who has also been with CIS um, and has done a lot of work in India. Uh, we have Illinois, who is uh, based at CIS Bangalore, um, and they've actually started a new project on AI, so 
she's going to present their new work um, in that field. And we have Kea Spark from Seoul, who uh, works with OpenNet Korea and Seoul National University. Sorry, Korea National University in Seoul. Uh, no, I know, it's a different university. Uh, not as good, definitely not as good. Uh, and who was a co-host of one of our events. So without further ado, we're waiting for one person because we thought industry needed a say while we kept slagging them off. Uh, but we don't have Google in the room yet. Um, Jake Lucci will join us, and he's the head of AI and content uh, for public policy based out of Hong Kong. Um, so this was um, our series. I don't know how well you can see it. Um, the Hong Kong event was on framing the agenda, sort of throwing out all the big picture questions for the region, uh, realizing we didn't even all have the same vocabulary, which of course is something common to AI conversations everywhere. Um, in Seoul, we did a deep dive into ethics, safety, and societal impact. Um, so a lot of conversations around privacy and security of AI, um, and which is also sort of endemic to building trust. And the last one was held in Tokyo, and it was on AI for social good. Um, I don't like the term beneficial AI because it implies there's a whole tranche of evil AI. So all the AI for good, beneficial AI, I, I feel it's unnecessary. We don't do that with any other technology. Say it's copyright for good. Of course we know there's copyright for evil, but we don't feel the need to keep saying it. So that, you know, what is it about AI that we feel the need to keep telling people, no, no, it's really good. Uh, but we thought Tokyo was a great place to actually talk about social good, given adoption and given a lot of very peculiar problems um, endemic to Japanese society that actually help with uptake. Um, so those were the three events that we did. Um, we've got a few, you know, just images and posters from the events. Um, and we also had a pop-up art show in Hong Kong, uh, partly because I really believe you can't have conversations about anything new without looking at how artists, writers uh, are actually viewing the world, what they've seen way before law and policy catch up. So we had a pop-up art show on works created using artificial intelligence as well as works critiquing artificial intelligence. So, you know, things looking at the trolley problem, playing with the moral machine game, um, looking at how Hong Kong actually used DNA um, samples from cups and other things to regenerate using AI faces of the people, and it was called the face of litter campaign, you know, sort of a very powerful way of saying these are the awful people that we need to ostracize in society because they littered. And you know how accurate or inaccurate were the images generated by machine learning. Um, so we, we had a lot of really controversial um, examples of how it's used and it really generated a fantastic conversation. I think one of the computer science professors, he kept looking at the agenda saying, is this part of our conference? Like, why is there a nacho? But at the end of the evening, after a couple of glasses of wine, he actually said, you know what? Everything else I knew, this is like, this totally blew my mind. I've never really thought about art as a computer scientist. Um, so these are just some images from our events. We created reading lists for each of them. We actually translated some papers on safety in machine learning, uh, the IEEE um, document on AI ethics and standards into Korean, into Japanese, because we thought unless you bridge that barrier, you're not actually even talking about the same things. Um, and then these are some of the reasons why we wanted to talk about what's different and what's new. So when you look at this image, anyone know what this is? Guesses? Ingredients of this image? Just shout out suggestions. Who's the guy there? Priest, yeah? And what's he, what is the thing he's doing? Any guesses? So he's co conducting a funeral for the Sony Ibo, for the little robot dogs. And I think this was an image from our Tokyo conference that if I had to encapsulate, like if I picked one image to sort of sum up our series, this was it. We always talk about artificial intelligence as something external, not embodied, not something that has emotive you know, uh, elements. And here, I mean, when Sony retired the Ibo, and then stopped supporting them in 2014, people were so distraught that they were, they were getting counseling, they were having therapy, and they were actually conducting funerals in very serious temples for all of these dead dogs. So, I mean, this really spoke, I mean, and I think this was something very, very clear, the, the idea of affect and emotion and the way we form relationships with technology. And I think, you know, we've started this with the Tamagotchi pets long ago, for those of you old enough to remember it, uh, I am. 
and uh, right down to like the Ibo and like different forms of you know virtual girlfriends um, and other types of games that we play, avatars online, and like how they're not something that's just technology as a slave or an object to do a particular purpose, like lift heavy things. It's also about companionship. And I think that's something that came out very, very strongly for us in Asia. Um, and in terms of use cases, these were a lot of the images that kept coming up. Farming, the ways that AI could revolutionize it in Asia, which is still so heavily reliant on it. Um, disaster management, especially with typhoons. Micro insurance schemes that actually look at how people can be insured differently around natural disasters in Asia. Um, the idea of rote learning in places like China and a lot of Asia actually, how AI could actually disrupt education and provide more humane ways of people you know, learning at their own pace uh, in ways that are personalized and tailored. Um, and this is one of my favorite images. This woman is a hero. I mean, she's such a rock star. Um, this is, you know, aging is a very, very big problem in a lot of Asia. People in Hong Kong and Japan are living longer and longer, but they're not having children largely because of companion robots removing the need to have sex at all in a lot of places, people finding relationships complicated, people finding work more and more all-consuming. Um, so we have aging populations that don't have children and grandchildren who are going to look after them. So we, one term we kept hearing in our conversations was around the idea of AI being a solution to missing workforces. And someone in our Tokyo conference said something deeply politically incorrect that as any outsider would have felt very embarrassed to say it, but he was Japanese and he said it. Um, he said, you know why we feel comfortable with the idea of AI and domestic sensors and robots? We really don't want immigrants. We don't want foreigners. We would rather trust someone that even through machine learning and translation can speak Japanese and embody our cultures and values than actually have immigrants come and perform jobs that we no longer have people to do. Um, and it was a really polarizing comment. People said, I can't believe you actually said that out loud. And he said, it's true. You know, we're a very homogenous society. We're not used to outsiders. We're bad with languages. So it's much easier for us to imagine a companion at home that's a neutral uh, machine than to imagine people that we may or may not get along with or understand or feel, you know, resonate with our own culture. Um, so that was like a real, you know, eureka moment for a lot of us. Um, and in terms of responses to some of these problems of aging, disaster, um, these were some of the examples that came up of how with a lot of crops and disease, AI can actually help diagnose what are problems with plants in remote areas and actually, you know, you take the image, you send it, it actually analyzes what blight or what sort of crop damage is occurring with rice plants. Um, this was a great startup in Myanmar called Bindes, which actually wants to provide more local content in the Burmese language and actually sort of be a solution where Google search might fail. Uh, and it's not meant as a replacement because they'll never be as big as Google or as ubiquitous or as good. But they were saying maybe we'll, you know, we'll fill a local niche in local content. And they've now partnered with um, one of the local news providers to actually provide and translate news into the Burmese language and make it more local, you know, hyper-local in a lot of ways for what people need. Um, and this was sort of the pepper robot goes to school and not just goes to school to help people, but actually goes to school to get educated as a student. Um, but also you can see like all of the older people in the school are thrilled to have this robot to play with and engage with. Um, and the, the, the robot actually said something like, you know, I really hope to be a good student. I'm gonna try my best. Um, so there are lots of these ways in which they're invading the classroom, the farming spaces, where we look at disasters. So there were a lot of really positive use cases that came up. And I think in a lot of cases, we almost had to remind them to be worried and say, you know, what about privacy? What about security? And I think there was this sort of real, it wasn't so much hubris that the technology would work. I think it was this genuine desire for it to work, but also this sense that Somebody else will fix that. We're just going to keep producing the tech. There'll be a lawyer somewhere. There'll be an ethicist, a philosopher. And actually, in our Korea conference, um, our dinner keynote was this wonderful keynote about living with other intelligences, um, where the speaker said, well, we've actually lived with all kinds of other intelligences in this region, with spirits, spirit animals, with gods and goddesses that have personalities. The idea of AI having a personality or, you know, machine learning or Siri or her, 
as we've seen in the movies, um, that's not really unusual. It's just sort of along that whole trajectory, we don't find them alien. Um, so these are just some of the learnings. We're going to produce a report that actually summarizes a lot of the really rich content. Um, I can't really read it here, so I don't expect you can. Um, I'll just tell you very, very quickly um, some of them. Um, things like um, the effects on labor might be very different, making some jobs and workers redundant and creating and modifying other jobs, which might be very, very different in Asia given the nature of labor markets. The informal uh, gig economy having completely different uh, sort of structures in uh, Asia. Uh, the idea of mobility and different cultural contexts of polity and trust. Um, there's a lot of great work in Japan on uh, uh, policies like the tentative AI R&D guidelines presented at the G7 and the OECD meetings, and that was a great use case of how Japan had said, instead of just formulating national policy, why don't we actually take it to an international forum so that whatever we do in the region is already embedded in international processes and structures. Um, and it was a very detailed policy framework. Um, in terms of education and learning, um, we talked about how we increasingly need to rely on humans to provide different skills than the easily automatable. Creativity, subjective reasoning, imagination, storytelling, uh, all of which are not as strong in a lot of Asian countries that rely on rote learning, um, and how we need to develop different areas of cognitive functioning. Uh, then the idea of capability aug augmentation came up. I think there's less fear about displacement and a lot of openness to working with AI as opposed to AI being a worker instead of us um, and all the different ways that can help. Um, tensions between innovation and safety in countries that look to technology like AI to leapfrog various stages of development and see it as a way that they can actually excel and I'm going to call on Danith to actually talk about this sort of, you know, the way the media frames it as a sort of AI arms race between the U.S. and China and how China has overtaken the U.S. in terms of filing patents in AI and in many other ways. So Danith will talk about that. Um, we also talked about when ethics get encoded and who actually create, you know, what cultural values are embedded in the technology. And there was a lot of actual hope about law, not just as a constraint, but as an actual enabler, saying, can governments and policymakers set good incentives for the law to actually make AI actually realize the potential for good and minimize harm in many ways? Um, and a very, very strong undercurrent through all of our conferences was the idea of engaging the underrepresented. And there'll be others who'll talk about how the training data sets on which a lot of machine learning applications are uh, developing are not necessarily representative data sets. And there are many, many reasons for that, including the fact that a lot of Asians are not actively engaging in the activities of data production. They are not actually producing data about themselves. And I think for me, this is a particular sort of paradox where damned if you do, damned if you don't. You're excluded if you don't participate in the data. You're also excluded if you participate and it reinforces and amplifies existing social inequalities. So, you know, we, we, which way do you go? Um, so I'm just going to stop here. Um, I've got a couple more slides, but I'll just actually go to the last one to say what we're doing next in this space in case you want to engage. I mean, those are pictures of black boxes and flight recorders, um, which are very endemic also in the way we talk about it in Asia. These are the sort of keyword takeaways that came out, the idea of context, culture, which are the actors involved, uh, what are the processes and means by which we regulate or don't regulate AI, the concept of ownership and stewardship, um, especially the idea of control and consent, which I think, you know, we're seeing that consent doesn't work, but it particularly doesn't work when a lot of it is ambient intelligence being gathered without the opportunity to say, don't put me in this data gathering exercise. Um, the idea of collaboration and community, because the problems that AI is being used in service of seem so intractable without algorithms that can actually do this at scale that I think that does shift the debate in a lot of developing emerging economies. Um, the idea of sustainability, I think, also came up in our conference a lot. And finally, diversity. So on the last slide, some next steps. We're going to be doing a set of AI case studies, specifically looking at use cases in Asia. Uh, we're going to do a call for papers for people who'd like to actually contribute to this collection. 
Um, a companion volume, which is sort of the more fun end of it, is a sort of set of essays on AI futures, specifically coming up with non-Western ways of imagining the future with AI, you know, building on a lot of local storytelling and dreams and myths and gods and goddesses and all the things I mentioned before uh, from Asian pop culture. Um, we're doing a, a new series of events. We did Hong Kong, Seoul, and Tokyo last year. This year, we're going to do India in February. We're doing New Zealand slash Singapore after that to be decided this week. Um, and we're doing Indonesia. And Indonesia will spend a lot more time looking at issues of content and the ways in which automation can actually help or make hate speech um, and radicalization better or worse. Uh, so open questions there. And then we're doing an AI cookbook, sort of recipes for what good AI policy looks like. Um, again, one sort of way of demystifying the vocabulary and using more you know, grounded ways of talking about it, like a cookbook and recipes um, for people to think about when you, know, you want to use AI. Should you use AI? What can it solve? What is it good at? Where is the technology not there yet? Um, and some of the collaborations and co-convening um, activities are with the Partnership on AI, which many of you may know. Um, with six companies started out with the, all the, the main players in this race um, and has now expanded to actually include a lot of not-for-profits um, and civil society. Uh, CIS and us are two from Asia. Um, the Ethics and Governance of AI Fund, which is run by the Media Lab at MIT and the Berkman Center. Um, we have a grant from them to work on some of this. And we'll be collaborating with Chatham House um, UK on a lot of the conversations around this um, in Asia and actually having policy impact in this space. Um, we also did an issue on AI and trust at the ICDPPC, which came up with lots of really interesting ways that people are thinking about trust. So I'll just end here and open it up to our um, panel here. Um, I asked them to each come up with either their idea of a utopia or dystopia using AI from their context, or to actually share like a favorite story in this space. So um, Jake, do you wanna start? And actually before we do that, we'd ask people to actually think of three keywords. When they think of AI in Asia, what do they think of? So I'm actually gonna throw it out to all of you. When you think of AI in Asia, throw out some keywords to see if our group actually matches what you were gonna say. One word keywords. Did someone say big? No. <laughs> it's true, yeah. Anything? Okay, we'll just turn it over. Jake, do you wanna start from there? Yeah, I don't even know where I come from anymore. So when you posed this question, I was a little bit confused at where to answer. Do I answer the United States? Do I answer Hong Kong, where I live now, or Thailand, where I've spent most of the last decade? So I decided to go with Thailand, and I was thinking I've been very heartened by a lot of the interesting healthcare research that's going on there. And so I think my utopia, to get into your question, would be where sort of geographic origin or where you live in a place like Thailand doesn't determine your access to healthcare um, or education services. That's my, that's my utopian uh, vision. Healthcare, regardless of where you are? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Where you are. Portability? Yeah. Okay. Jack? <laughs> um, initially, I had this story about robots, but I'm just going to ping off this. Um, <laughs> which I guess, if it's about healthcare and regardless of where you are, I think it's also about regardless of what kind of body you have, no? Um, in particular, if you have like a gender diverse body and so on. Or, bodies with different kinds of abilities, then yeah, access to that. And a utopia would also be like, data sets will have an expiry date that they will just erase at some point. Self-destructing data sets, yeah, nice. Danid? Um, so just building up on the robots, I have a, a, a favorite story to tell. So in China, there are what you might call babysitting robots. They are toys that look like very famous anime characters, but they have the ability to converse with your child, and they are part caretakers, part friends, part educators, part even sibling um, for kids who are lonely. So this is something that is gaining a lot of traction in China and really helping parents leave their kids alone or with grandparents or with caretakers. I don't know if you've noticed this, but there are a lot of stories about abuse in China about uh, caretakers um, abusing the, the kids or in kindergartens, and the parents are very much afraid uh, of leaving their kids alone, even with strangers that they think they trust. So this is kind of a, 
solution for parents who are able to go out and work but still have access to what the kid is doing and even can teach them English um, for a lower price, which is something that the parents are very passionate about. Is it utopian? Is it dystopian? I feel like that would depend on our perspective. I think that from a local perspective, I think it's, it's very utopian, but from a, a Westerner perspective, people are like, oh my God, this is completely dystopian. So I, I guess that is left up to you to decide. Thank you. Medici? Yeah, um, I think my idea of a, an AI future would be deliberate, because I think right now we're in this phase where it's, um, fashionable to be worried about the race and to be ahead of the curve and to be leading um, you know the race so to speak and I think it would be it would be really nice if it was fashionable to be slow and deliberate and think about what are we running with and where are we running to and why are we doing this that would be great Thank as you. a lazy person I can totally buy that don't run at all <laughs> yes <Yeah. laughs> Illinois Okay, I, I mean, I don't know if this is a dystopian or a utopian, but I'm, I'm interested in concepts of virtual reality and what is AI doing to our social uh, interactions between each other. And um, I guess in some ways that's very, you know, context specific because like you said, uh, your vision of robot nannies could be utopian, but it can also be uh, dystopian depending on what perspective you're coming from. Okay, yes. <coughs> When you asked for uh, a single word um, about this event, I almost said data. Mm. Uh, because AI uh, is a program. I mean, OS is a program. Uh, it can be copied. It can be made available on uh, cloud. Um, so that you know, a program has gotten more intelligent than before should not be a, a game changer. Um, but what's going to change the game is uh, the data that's needed to uh, train AI. Uh, a brain is just, uh, you know, a brain is just a bunch of mo uh, protein molecules. Uh, what makes brain intelligent is the memory, uh, the experience, uh, the, you know, identities that the brain, uh, that constitute uh, that a human brain. So a uh, program without data uh, really uh, does not mean anything. So for me, utopia is data socialism, where people have more or less equal access to data that's going to enable uh, the great you know, features of uh, AI so that it's not uh, monopolized by a small number of uh, uh, players. Uh, that data socialism, I think, uh, I'm hoping that will uh, abate uh, some of the economic impact, um, economic impact uh, that uh, we are uh, concerned about, like you know, displacing workers and uh, worsening inequality. Um, so, you know, what I just said, I think, includes my vision of uh, dystopia as well. Uh, where uh, data sit in uh, silos uh, controlled by a small number of uh, players, uh, not being made possible, uh, you know, not being accessible to uh, a great number of people. Uh, where did I get this idea? Did you watch the movie? Science uh, fiction. Yes. Did you watch the movie uh, uh, Deus Ex Machina? Uh, yeah. If you saw through to the ending, the guru reveals where he got the data to uh, inform, to, to train you know, her robots. Does anyone remember what the source was? Yes, the internet. So it was from us. We all together own the data. That's why we talk about data socialism. Thank you. So much to unpack there. Um, the idea of sort of data and memory um, actually brings up something that came up in one of our conferences where um, someone showed us demos of psychologists or therapists, um, which were AI, um, made in Japan. And there was this idea that people would feel really weird talking about their deepest, darkest secrets to something that wasn't <coughs> real. Um, and they actually found it was exactly the opposite because they felt a lack of judgment. Um, which again is really interesting given that we don't want to talk to other people about our problems because we feel judged, yet humans have an ability to forget things. 
whereas this is something that actually collectively listens and stores every single horrible thing you told it, and that is almost permanent, yet people feel they're not being judged by that and decisions aren't being made. So that sort of was a very interesting um, paradox as well. So, yeah? Um, there's actually an app called Replica, um, if people are familiar with it, that actually creates a, a, a replicant, or a replica of you uh, on the cloud. It creates kind of a virtual identity, and the more you speak to it, the more it knows you. So it's basically almost as if you were having a conversation with someone who is you, who understands you and, and really knows what you're thinking and what you're doing, and people love it. The original idea behind it was uh, from a woman who ha her husband died, he passed away, and she really missed him, and she missed, missed having conversation with someone who really knew her, was her best friend, and she created that app, and now it's, it's really getting all over, and people have testimonials of saying it's the most meaningful and uh, not judging conversation that they had, and it's been helping people a lot, mm -hmm. so in that sense, really connects to an application of that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to turn now to Illinois to tell us about the work that CIS has been doing um, on AI in India, um, and then we'll open it up to the others. Thank, thanks, Malavika. Um, so CIS began research in AI just a couple months ago uh, in India, and we are doing a sectoral analysis. So we're looking at four different sectors and uh, the implementation and adoption of AI in those sectors, um, including finance, healthcare, IT, and governance. And I think we're, we're the furthest in our healthcare study. So I was gonna share some of the learnings that we've come up or that have come out of that research because I think they give context to some of the questions that Malavika posed, at least on the thread, of what is, what is um, unique about Asia and perhaps India as a context when you're talking about AI. So as part of our research, we had a roundtable with, with healthcare startups in, in Bangalore using AI and uh, developing um, AI products, and we also brought in practitioners, so surgeons who might be using AI or doctors who are using AI. And um, I I'll just kind of go through some of those learnings, perhaps starting with the data. So, so startups were saying that getting access to initial data to create a prototype was difficult in the Indian context because uh, India does not have really good um, open data, open medical data. And so they were actually taking and, and using open data from contexts like the US or the UK and building their prototype and then going to hospitals with, with their prototype. Um, and then once the, the hospital saw the prototype, they were more open to sharing their data with them. Um, but the challenge in that is that the initial prototype is built off of US data with US demographics. Um, and so then retraining, there is you know, a need to retrain that data to Indian demographics, which is <coughs> incredibly important when you're talking about healthcare. <laughs> um, then they, they talked about once they had access to data from the hospital, there is a large amount of data. India doesn't have very strict re um, regulations around sharing the data, but that data came um, in many different shapes and sizes. It could be a, a picture of doctor's notes, and they had to try to like unpack those doc, you know, what exactly was that picture saying, and then make it usable. So there's still a lot of work in terms of um, having access to standardized and usable usable data. Um, <coughs> then it, it was interesting when they were talking about design, you know, design of these products and these platforms. Uh, they, they, they called out the need for a, um, standard design guidelines and many of the companies are actually adopting their own and kind of uh, making their own guidelines as they are designing these platforms. Some of the key principles that came out um, that are de design or that are, that are guiding the design include uh, incorporating the the principle of do no harm, which is a, a traditional principle in the the healthcare um, sector. Uh, a strong emphasis on choice and consent for the the user. That the compliance is on the data controller, so regulatory compliance always rests with the data controller. Um, that the the services should always augment and should never take over the position of a, a practitioner. So they were not aiming and were not an, 
in you know the present creating systems that were autonomous and making autonomous decisions for doctors. Um, and one way that they're addressing the, the privacy question is to just not use identifying information. So they might use personal data, but it's not identified, um, or you can't link it to a person. Um, and then last of all is that promoting human-to-human -human interaction through um, their, their services. So one example was of a, a, an app, or it was a chat bot that, that worked with um, individuals with a mental, mental health um, um, perhaps depression. And so the idea was that the chatbot would help to guide the person to a practitioner that could, could then assist them. Um, in, in terms of, you know, when we talk to them about what are challenges that they're facing in, in adoption of their services, uh, one, one big one that came up was that when they go to hospitals or doctors with their product, often they're asked for a proof of a clinical trial, um, which is a little more traditionally something that you find around drugs and kind of drug testing and is not an appropriate standard for uh, mobile or health or medical devices. Um, and that said, they found uh, or they identified a regulatory gap on medical devices, but I think India is considering filling this as there's some draft rules coming out in 2018. And then they also found a knowledge gap between uh, with, with doctors and their ability to use use the systems um, that were they were designing. Um, and when we discussed implementation, it, it was interesting actually, specifically with the example of the chat pot, bot that worked with um, different patients from different uh, you know a, a mental background. Uh, they actually found that the chat bot was very empathetic. I mean, so when they were taking user feedback, a lot of the feedback was that it's a very empathetic service and that they uh, prefer using that service versus trying to talk to you know a family member about uh, what they're going through. Um, it was also interesting around questions of liability. The doctors were saying at this point, at least the systems are making them more liable <laughs> because um, so if it's used for monitoring a patient, they have AI working in a system that's monitoring a patient, uh, and they're getting real-time updates on their phone, and they have to recognize that they're getting those updates on the phone. Uh, they no longer can say, like, the nurse forgot to tell me, or I somehow missed this, but there's, you know, very clear accountability on if they have that information and if they reacted to that, that information. Um, and generally, uh, I think that there was a consensus that the, the tools and the services that are coming out are assisting doctors, and this kind of aligned with the uh, research we did just around news items and, and different reports around the use of AI in the health sector in India, in that it is, um, those, those reports are very positive, and that it's going to help reach, you know, a number of different patients that are not reached right now. Um, and it's interesting because it's a different narrative that, than that that we see, for example, in the IT sector in India, where a lot of the news items are about how AI is going to displace jobs. Um, this was, you know, in the health sector, it's, it's a very positive narrative. Um, so those are some of our, our key learnings from the research, and maybe I'll stop there. Thank you. Did, did you find that um, doctors actually saw this as competition in some way, that they didn't want to engage because they thought this was going to do uh, their job better? At least not with, not with the participants. Um, from Whoop. Not, not with the participants at the round table. I think we've seen um, news items that might interview a doctor who initially might think it's competition, mm -hmm. and then after they've adapted, adopted the service, they realize that it, it augments their job mm -hmm. rather than replaces their job. Thank you. Um, KS, will you go uh, next? So this is, uh, I mean, AI in Asia, China. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk about, I'm going to talk from the experience of having hosted uh, Seoul seminar on AI exactly, uh, what, a year ago now? Yeah, uh, about the same time a year ago. Uh, I'm kind of a, a split uh, in between because uh, uh, I mean, the reason we have, uh, you know, this event, IGF, is because uh, UN thought that, uh, you know, internet is a, a great equalizer, a great liberator, uh, giving powerless people the same, you know, voice, power of information to agent, uh, the, the, the same as uh, governments and uh, companies. 
Um, now, AI also, I think, has a potential of being a great equalizer and uh, liberator. Uh, but at the same time, uh, when you go to Asia, uh, you'll see uh, that uh, just as uh, many of the Asian countries uh, saw more of the economic uh, significance of the internet than social significance, uh, I see a similar trend in Asia. Uh, AI is uh, AI is being uh, more appreciated for its uh, economic potential than its uh, social potential. Um, and I'm I'm hoping that that is not the reason why uh, many of Asian commentators are uh, more uh, pragmatist. Then, and also the, the way people receive AI is more pragmatist uh, than what we see uh, uh, in uh, the West. Um, so, I mean, one uh, title uh, from the uh, one, uh, one title from the uh, Seoul seminar was uh, Safety of AI or AI for Safety. Uh, so what the, uh, what the presenter was trying to make a point is that there are too many people talking about whether AI is safe when AI can be used to make other things uh, safer. Um, and, you know, in large part, I also agree with him, but I don't want that to be part of this trend where uh, Asian countries see, uh, focus too much on the economic potential of AI as opposed to uh, social uh, potential. Uh, and it is uh, really important for Asian countries because um, the social welfare system uh, is not as well developed uh, in, uh, for instance, uh, Europe. Um, much of uh, 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 the, I mean, the taxation rate, uh, I mean, w we think that welfare in the U.S. is uh, not that great but their taxation rate is uh, like 35%. Korea's taxation rate, you know, the rate of uh, uh, the total amount of tax versus GDP, in Korea, 25%. Japan, like 27%. Uh, the social welfare uh, safety net provided by the government is not that uh, great uh, compared to, uh, <coughs> for instance, European standard. So if uh, AI is, uh, uh, you know, AI is uh, uh, really uh, sought for uh, as a tool for national economic uh, development, uh, we're gonna, uh, you know, we're not gonna be able to do much on abating uh, the uh, inequality problems that uh, it, will, it will cause. Um, so, um, yeah, that's why I'm split. Yeah, I'll talk more about that later. Yeah. I think that split also came up in how people couldn't decide if something was a utopia or dystopia, and I think it is both. Um, Vidushi, do you want to pitch in now? Yeah. Um, Vidushi's been doing a lot of work um, on this, and I think she has particular critiques about this whole trend of the, the move towards fairness and accountability, uh, that whole category of research and work. So over to you. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Vidushi, like Valvika said. Um, I work with Article 19 STEAM Digital and we look at ethical, legal, and um, regulatory approaches to AI. Uh, and so we're a part of the IEEE uh, Ethically Aligned Design Initiative, but also part of the Partnership on AI. Um, and at the same time, I'm based in Bangalore, India, where I read uh, the newspaper sometimes. Um, uh, and, I, and I read, um, and I listen to the discourse around AI at home. And there's this kind of really distinct uh, difference between how AI is spoken about and engaged with. And so what I wanted to share with you are just reflections that I've had um, in my attempt to like articulate my angst about like why isn't everyone saying the same thing? To like, okay, w what are the problems that underlie this difference? So I think the first thing is that we have dominant narratives that have kind of like led the discourse around AI. It became, um, you know, a particularly interesting field of study only a few years back. And um, 
What happens uh, particularly in India is that we're trying to fit Western ideals and Western narratives into our cultural uh, and national situation. So for example, let's look at data protection, right? So when we talk about data protection at the IEEE or at the Partnership on AI or at any such event um, that is usually, unfortunately, but usually <laughs> dominated by Western narratives, what we find is that there's a lot of um, focus on data protection and there's a lot of focus on how do I know how my data is being used. So let's take that and see how it, translate to, uh, how it translates to something like the Aadhaar scheme in India where people are begging to be counted. They're like, please take my data. Please add me into your data set. And please make sure I'm counted. Because um, in India, being a data subject is not a cause of concern. It's actually a sign of power. It signals to your government that please, OK, look at me. I'm visible. I'm a person. Um, and I deserve some sort of um, you know, help from you in x, y, z way. Um, so this is one thing that I find really problematic, is that we're taking Western ideals and we're like stamping them onto national uh, realities, but there's a deep, um, what's the word, like disharmony, is that a word? Divide. Yeah, there's a big, deep divide in how we think of it and how also we engage with it. Um, the second thing is that we often ignore the cultural realities of the situation, of the place in which AI is actually implemented. So the first was more national, you know, jurisdictional and legal, um, and also ideas about, you know, how the government lets you interact with them. But the second thing is, when we're talking about um, building data sets, for example, like we know that, okay, it's a problem that we don't always have representative data, um, and the data sets aren't, you know, always perfect. But in India, what happens is that this promise of efficiency over a large population is really seductive, right? So everyone's like, okay, we have this system that's going to make it efficient for 1.3 billion of us. Let's just go for it. But what we do, uh, what we don't think about are more intangible concerns that happen in the medium uh, term, which is like human rights implications on freedom of expression and privacy. Because we don't see them, we don't always immediately engage with them. And this is especially true when we talk about policy and legal discourse, not so much in sectoral regulation. Like Ellen, I just spoke about the health sector where there's a little more careful deliberation because we're talking about particular companies and they need to get data and then they realize, oh my God, all our data is from America. But when, as legal and uh, policy communities, I feel like we often um, talk in really broad terms, which ends up being really destructive to what we actually want to do. Um, so what often happens is that we have really accurate answers, but we've asked all the wrong questions, right? And so then we say, okay, uh, <laughs> we don't fully understand why, um, you know, uh, now let me think of an example. So in the US, you have critical sectors, right? So you have actual regulation and they're very strict about uh, what you ca can or can't do with respect to data. But in India, we don't even have data protection law except for two uh, particular sections in the IT Act, right? So we don't have an omnibus privacy law. And on top of that, we think of a situation where um, it's being deployed in a way that is less critical than, say, in the West. And that, that's another really uncomfortable situation that we find ourselves in often, uh, especially at the legal. I, I just want to clarify, I'm not saying that we're not thinking about it at all. Uh, maybe we are in the sectoral sense, but not so much in the legal um, and a broader legal sense. And the last thing is, uh, as Malvika said, I'm really critical of this idea of transparency and fairness as this thing that's going to save us all and make all our AI futures utopian because I feel like it's a very complex and loaded term. So when we talk about transparency, usually transparency is, um, it indicates like a, a vertical relationship with a state and a citizen. So you owe me an explanation of, uh, you know, how you're governing me. And uh, there are some constitutional legal frameworks that apply to that particular relationship. And when we try to translate that, that vertical relationship onto horizontal relationships, what we find is that transparency doesn't always work with uh, companies. And I'm sure Jake can tell us more about the challenges that you face on a day-to-day -day basis, because we can't hold them to the same standard. We shouldn't hold democratically elected governments to the same standard as we hold private companies. But that, um, that level of granularity is, is really missing, um, especially in India, but I also think around the world. I think I feel it more because I live in India, but definitely around the world. Um, and also when it comes to machine learning, transparency can give us very little because by definition, machine learning recreates rules with time. 
And so even if we have the algorithm, we need the data. <laughs> and if we don't have the data, um, you know, transparency means very little. It doesn't help us achieve fairness, and it definitely doesn't help us achieve accountability. And, and I realize this is a really interesting um, and very, very popular f uh, area of study within academic circles. But what I find really problematic is that we're not thinking of it in as um, deep and as critical terms when we're actually implementing AI and definitely not when we're thinking of um, developing AI. And so these are a, a few um, insights that I think uh, we need to think about going forward because as it's easy to talk about, um, you know, we want, f we shouldn't deploy AI unless it's fair. But we don't know what fair means, we don't know how to articulate fair in legal terms, and we definitely don't know how to use the word fair in a way that makes sense to the person deploying uh, and developing the AI. So I think these are some challenges we should think about going forward. Thank you. Um, some of you may have seen this great um, tweet storm from uh, Professor Arvind Narayanan at Princeton CITP, where he was saying, lawyers are very used to dealing with ideas of fair and equitable, computer scientists are not, and if you want them to program fairness, there needs to be a shared common standard or understanding, and he said, when they actually looked at it in a conference, there were 21 standards of fairness which legal systems are completely comfortable with working around. And you know, we're used to different jurisdictions, we're used to different uh, systems of law, civil law, common law, we're used to this. But he said, as a computer scientist, if you want me to program and actually action something, I can't work with 21 definitions of fairness, like what does that even look like? And I think a lot of humanities people on the thread sort of push back saying, well, it's sort of like saying there is one internet, there are many internets, you know, there are many ways of looking at this. So. It, it, it isn't as intractable a problem, but I think it, it kind of gets to what you're saying as well, this yeah. sort of definitional and implementation challenge when it comes to very abstract ideas of fairness and equity. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Dani to actually talk. I mean, China is the big, uh, big success story in this field. Uh, and again, I think it also raises the sort of utopian dystopian uh, paradox that we're coming across. So tell us about all the recent trends or what you're working on in China? Um, so obviously, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not Chinese. <laughs> I'm based in China, and China is obviously a very, very big country. And they have a pretty fragmented mm -hmm. market in the sense that there are so many development, developments in so many areas, but then again, they do have a common thread. And to those of you who have read the next uh, generation of AI policy or development plan that came out from China um, in July, I believe, have a, a pretty good sense of where this is headed, at least uh, from the government side. And I think that one thing that has always been a point of interest uh, when speaking about this in the West is kind of the differences in how we, th we feel like, and I think that ties into what Vidushi said in, in Malavika, that we speak in the same code, but we are saying completely different things. So even in, even in the level of the applications that we build, um, they may be based on the same language, but their uses, their databases, their demands are completely different. And what I kind of sense is that we're getting to a point where we are going to see a pretty serious divergence in technology, where a certain applications of machine learning and other AI kind of technology are going to be used for certain things. And if there's one thing that I think we all know is that there's a cycle in the sense that humans create technology, but crea technology also creates the way that we behave as humans. And this kind of reinforcing cycle is going to lead us to a point where we're going to start seeing technology that is completely different. Even though if you open the code, you might be speaking in the same language. So I mean, I think that there are very strong themes in China in terms of healthcare, in terms of infrastructure. Um, Alibaba has been doing some pretty great work in, in smart cities. Tencent is going into healthcare and, and really helping make uh, healthcare services more accessible. Baidu is going to autonomous vehicles. We have uh, ByteDance doing media. And I, I could go on forever because you know what? There are so many companies doing such incredible things in China with incredible amounts of data and, and computing power that this is really a market that for me, has no end in that sense. I think that what is interesting to talk about in this, in this kind of context is the idea of an arms race, uh, which has been catching on pretty strongly. And I think that it is a, it's a scary terminology that kind of creates a, a zero-sum game mentality, which I, I hope 
that we can avoid in that sense of winner takes it all and there are only two very powerful powerful countries that kind of broadcast because if we look at the US, we say, okay, the US is home to all the really big multinational corporations that have all these amazing technologies and are basically going around the world and providing a lot of services. And then in China, we're looking at one bell, one road that is building a lot of infrastructure and has a lot of uh, geopolitical influence. And we say, okay, so through that, they will take in their technology and kind of build that into the infrastructure, which I think is true, by the way. So we're kind of tempted to see this in a very binary sense. And I think that that is also the, prob the problem with programming, right? Because it's like true or false, zero or one, China or the US. It's very tempting to think about it because it really simplifies the way we look at the application of AI. But I would strongly urge you against it. And I think that a panel called AI in Asia is perhaps <laughs> the best way to do that, to really show the difference in, in the countries and in the applications that they, they want and they need and they have and how they treat data and how they think about development of AI. There is so much diversity to be discussed, then I really think reducing it to kind of China versus US is in a way efficient. But it, and it gives us very accurate answers, but are we, are we really asking the, the right questions in, in that sense? So I feel like it's very tempting to go in and say, you know what, the US does this and China does this, and this is exactly what AI is going to look like. But I really don't think that is the case because even if we provide these kind of services, and I think Jay could really speak about that, Google provides the same structure like, or the same services that are based on the same code, but they are used in completely different ways and are applied in completely different ways within countries. So I feel like if there's one takeaway that I would like to give you is that the technology may be the same, but the people using it are different. And this kind of difference is going to continue translating into a technology that is going to be different even in the level of design. Thanks, Danny. Um, I think Google is interesting in all kinds of ways because I think, you know, it, 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 it does represent one fear that people have that this is a game that only the really big companies can play just because of the amount, the volume of data that they have. So it's very hard for a new startup to get into this space and make impact. But I think on the other hand, Google has something like TensorFlow, which actually allows people to use it in an open source manner and say, here's a tool. All of you can play at this AI game too. So I think. That's another sort of paradox we see where you're very big, but you're also making a lot of your tools and increasingly your research um, also available on you know, safety um, in machine learning. So over to you if you wanna share what you're working on in Asia and where you see the challenges and opportunities. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I've been very struck by what so many of you have said and it resonates a lot. I think in Asia, we are in a situation where we have tons and tons of great talent, um, and we also have lots of countries who are wanting to stand up and play a global leadership role in this. I mean, China's obviously one, but I think Japan is another very important one um, who's really taking a leadership role in thinking through some of how kind of the international community can come together to look at how to promote this technology and make sure that it is beneficial to as large a number of people as possible, while also addressing some of the concerns around safety and ethics and, and so on and so forth. So. I mean, at Google, we think about this in a few ways. There's obviously products that we build that try to make sure that they are um, bring new accessibility to new populations. And I mean, one of the examples I often talk about is Translate, right? And the fact that you know Translate now relies on neural machine translation makes it much more accurate and allows people who you know don't speak English to access the internet in ways that were never possible before, and to communicate with one another, and to do lots of new things that were never done before. Um, but then, beyond the product perspective, at Google we're also trying to do more and more to collaborate with researchers in this region. Um, so for example, we often talk about this uh, case of us collaborating with Indian researchers to be able to diagnose diabetic retinopathy, um, which is a very treatable disease, um, but that results in blindness for many, many people if it's not caught early. Um, and actually, if you, it's relatively easy to diagnose, but if you live in a country like India where many people don't have access to health services, then it's very difficult to ever get that diagnosis. Um, and so we've now been able to work with Indian researchers to use machine learning as a way of uh, diagnosing this problem at scale at very low cost. But then beyond those direct partnerships, uh, there's a lot of, I think, the future here and how we can make sure that the people in Asia can really continue to play a leadership role is by making sure that they then have access to the tools to develop homegrown solutions. And so Malavika mentioned TensorFlow as one of those, um, which is uh, our open source software library that allows people to uh, do machine learning, take any data that they have themselves, and then to use TensorFlow as a way of um, devising machine learning solutions to problems. 
Um, we've also been opening up more and more data sets, um, quite large data sets. So for example, video and image um, data sets that are based um, from YouTube, natural language, um, voice data sets that cover many, many languages around the world. Um, and while these are obviously not equally representative of all the people in the world, they do come from, you know, a store of data that has been um, developed from all around the world. And they allow people and researchers to take these data sets and use TensorFlow and devise interesting solutions to problems, whether image-based, voice-based. Um, so this is another way that we're trying to make sure that people who from, you know, diverse backgrounds from around the world can really participate in this technology in new ways. Um, I wanted to, to also touch quickly on some of these fairness points that were raised earlier, because at Google, this is one of the things that we spend the most time thinking about and talking about internally, which is how do we make sure that um, machine learning is a source for actually combating discrimination and bias, and that is helping to um, promote you know, positive values and not amplifying bias. Uh, but it's a really, really thorny and complicated issue, um, because as Malavika mentioned, fairness is not a very easy to define concept. And what do we mean when we talk about fair? Are we, do we want these things to be neutral? To be, meaning that you know, anyone uh, that has an equal chance, basically, of, of having you know, a particular outcome, or do we want it to actively promote some notion of equality, where if there's bias that exists in the offline world, we want machine learning to actually proactively combat that bias, rather than just being neutral toward that bias? Um, these are open questions, and people have different views on it. Um, and whose you know, sort of role is it to make those decisions? Um, this, this is very challenging. So one of the ways that we've been trying to help get at that within Google, uh, we've developed this People Plus AI research initiative, which basically brings together researchers from different parts of the company um, to come together and produce um, tools that are useful for thinking through these challenges. Um, one of them we recently released was a, what we call the facets tool, which allows people to look at what are the features within a data set that were um, relevant for particular outcomes, and then to visualize those. So if you're using a machine learning way of saying, you know, identifying shoes, and you give, you know, the classifier a bunch of uh, images of shoes, and then ask it to then identify shoes, this tool allows you to look at the features from the data set that you put in and see which ones are the relevant ones that it's looking at, and then visualize those. So then you can see, well, is it t paying attention to the right features that we care about? And so you can imagine, and from the perspective of bias and discrimination, this is really important, because if you're looking at you know, a data set that involves people, and you want to know, is it looking at the right features or not? And then once you can visualize that, then you can make adjustments right, to reduce that bias and re reduce that discrimination. Um, so there, across the company, we're working on tons and tons of initiatives like that, but that's, that's just one example. Um, but then even within, this is sort of a question about research, but then also I think there's an interesting question about how we can take machine learning as a tool to look at bias in the offline space. Um, and so we have, Google.org, we funded a project with the Gina Davis Institute that basically used um, an automated way of identifying the percentage of speaking roles that men and women have in, uh, in movies. So the 200 top grossing uh, box office movies of two years ago were basically plugged in and were able to find that men have, of course, twice the speaking time that women have, not a surprise to any of us. But another useful um, result from this study is that the, the myth that uh, movies with men as leading actors make more money was actually proven false, and that movies where the women were the lead roles actually made more money than the ones where men uh, were, making, were, were in the leads. So that actually maybe it's in Hollywood's interest to cast more women in, uh, in higher profile roles and give them more speaking time. Uh, and this kind of solution wouldn't really have been possible without this technology. So how can we take technology and apply it to challenging offline environments and make sure that we're um, helping to reduce discrimination where we can? Um, so these are just a few things at top of mind for me, but thanks. Thank you. Um, I know this bias issue is very, very um, fraught, and I know, you know, a lot of platforms have had really bad pushback when they've tried to use automated ways, like when Facebook took down that the famous napalm girl picture because it violated their guidelines around pornography. Like, can a computer tell what is art? We can barely tell what is art, right? So I think that was a huge backlash. And then finding images of black people were tagged as gorillas. So I mean, there's so many ways in which these sort of methods of tagging and filtering and autom you know, automation actually posing big issues. But I'm glad they're sort of coming out in the research community because I think what, what it really does is hold up a mirror to how biased people are uh, and how humanity offline is actually very biased. So I, I, it's a re I'm, 
It's a terrible way to do it, but I'm glad it's, it's at least surfaced a conversation around bias. Um, and I think that's a really good point at which to bring in Jack, who does a lot of work around um, women's rights, around gender and sexuality in Asia. Uh, so I wonder, especially responding to Jake or even your own work in the field, um, what does AI in Asia sort of mean for you? Thanks, Malavika. As I'm listening to the whole panel, I just came from a session around gender and access. I feel like I am existing in parallel universes, no? It's kind of a weird situation where on like 10 minutes before we were talking about trying to deploy um, affordable, accessible, as cheap as possible technology to enable access to disconnected areas, which is still 50%. And then 10 minutes later, we're talking about robotics and machine learning and funerals for dogs and so on and so forth. And it's in some way part of the same conversation. Um, right, because it's about access to technology that has the potential to change quite fundamentally power structures and the way in which we relate to each other. And it's the same question about asking who has access to those technology, who's making decisions around them, what is the technology, um, what, what change will the access to the technology or the control over the technology do in terms of how we are currently living our lives and understanding how society is being shaped and formed and towards addressing some of the issues around discrimination, exclusion, disparity that we are still contending with. And sometimes I find that in conversations around AI, machine learning, and so on, uh, there is, it's almost like a three-part question. So I work a lot with uh, people, well, I work a lot with women, and women being a very diverse group, and I also work a lot with queer people, so trans, lesbian, bisexual, and so on. S and when it comes to data, we have three problems. One is you're not being, not being counted, the one that Vidushi talks about, you're not part of the data set because you simply do not exist. And whether this is because you are a refugee, undocumented, or I just don't accept, an exi I just don't accept that trans people is a category to exist. Um, or you are hyper visible in data sets because you are deviant and outside of the norm and therefore you become very big um, and not quite like, you know, your shadow self is bigger than who you are or you are weirdly, oddly, wrongly represented. Mm -hmm. And this is something we know, right? Like these three problems exist currently in our engagement with data anyway. And we are now very enthusiastic to try and see what we can do with these data sets which are wholly expanded and wrong, um, which is great. I am a very, I love technology. I'm enthusiastic about it. Um, but I find this question about utopia, dystopia, also a very difficult one um, because like a Facebook status, it's complicated. Um, it's really like, you know, it's like existing in simultaneous reality at the same time, and we're kind of at the precipice of it, right? Simultaneous reality of where, in, on the one hand, um, I'm sitting in a session that talks about trying to get more diverse data sets to make sure that the research that we're doing around understanding the human body is actually reflective so that the medicines that we create is actually reflective of diversity in human bodies and genders and so on. Um, and in another session where we are still talking about access um, and not having access to technology and where decisions are being made about you anyway, regardless of whether or not you have access. So for me, there's a couple of things, I guess. One is the parallel with the conversation on AI and application and so on with the conversation on um, connectivity and access to the internet is an interesting one and one that actually helps to take down sometimes where the AI conversation sits into kind of material reality. Second is there's sort of these three components when we talk about technology and access, which is about um, the technology and the technology development and application, and then the structures of power around who owns the technology, what is the framework and narrative that is driving the development and application of the technology, and everything else in between that in terms of accountability, power, decision making. And at another end of the triangle is the body, like what actual bodies is going to be affected, whose actual bodies are going to be affected, and this kind of like triangulate relationship. So often we find the conversation happening either at this level, which is the technology development and application, or at this level, which is about structures of power, but more about policy and so on, but rarely at kind of like a relational level. Like how do we kind of create this relationship that speaks to each other at all three levels? And, um, the thing, and then it got me thinking about the context of Asia. I'm from Malaysia, um, and what can I think of 
in terms of this context that is Malaysia, um, that is Southeast Asia, for example. Um, Alibaba data. I mean, like China is not even Asia. Let's not even go there. No, like China, Korea, like East Asia. I'm like, ah, white Asia. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of a different ball game, no? Um, so what do we have in the context such as Malaysia? We have an acute lack of check, an acute lack of check and balances in terms of laws and policies to begin with, um, and around privacy to begin with, um, and we have the very um, enthusiastic deployment of economic development as a framework to talk about anything that is basically a shorthand for let's not talk about human rights. Let's just remove it. And then we have specific ways in which sexuality, gender, nationality, and other markers of identity intersect. And we are very early adopters of biometric technology. I mean, I wrote about biometric NRIC um, national identity cards in 2003. And these are identity cards with your name, your address, your race, your religion, your gender that you cannot actually change without killing yourself. Um, and then we have really bad current inefficiency and inaccuracy in data collection, often to justify a very specific position. So for example, Point of View, which is a partner in India, did a research recently looking at the categorization of data under these offenses of um, expression online. And then you have this randomly made up category of the sexual freak sitting next to the category of the cracker and the hacker out of this law that actually has no, you know, no categories to begin with. Um, and then we also, as kind of like a region, have less ability to negotiate international policy adoption around technology or adoption of application of technology to begin with. So this is the context. And then you put in AI. And then you go X, Y, Z. And then we talk about, and then you bring in this whole conversation. Let's look at this from a date access to technology framework. I don't even know where to start. Uh, but the good thing is, because I'm an optimist and I'm an activist, um, is that there's a whole bunch of also a lot of, I mean, there's also a really, really vibrant um, activist community that really intersects also with activism around culture, around urban planning, around design, around technology, um, that is very young as well, or maybe not so young, huh? I'm not young, okay, uh, young-ish. Um, that is also, you know, full of imagination and things which are coming up. There is a reclaiming of um, and a, a growing awareness around deterritorialization and decolonization of spaces and terrains, including that of digital technologies that I hope will, pre will present at least a different response, no, <coughs> to some of these questions. So, yeah, sorry, no answers here, but just a set of thoughts. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you brought up the ageism point among many other good points and it sort of reminds me of that great statement when uh, pe people were talking about how old people don't know how to use the internet and Vince famously said, oh no, actually I think we invented it, <laughs> uh, which I always come back to. I think that was just such a great uh, sort of reality check. Um, lots of really great points there. Um, before we go around to do another round of comments from uh, our panel, I was wondering if people had questions, comments, responses to any of what's been talked about. Yes, gentlemen at the back. If you could just say who you are. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, to the panelists for sharing uh, valuable information about AI in journal, uh, challenges and its application in every walk of life. Uh, presently, uh, I, I, my name is uh, Kharsha from uh, uh, Pakistan. Presently, we have a finalized uh, a draft, a digital Pakistan policy, and included a dedicated uh, chapter on IoTs and artificial intelligence and robotics due to its importance, particularly added uh, policy measures regarding the AI R&D and capacity buildings. Uh, as we know that the emerging technology, particularly artificial intelligence, are poised to change the future of the work, we can say that artificial intelligence, automation, and big data could affect about 50% of the world economy as per international reports. All human tasks can be performed by artificial intelligence based machine by 2060. 20, uh, so considering such projections about human versus technology race, uh, there is my suggestion proposals that we 
as a developing country, would like to share that our economies are ideal to run a sample pilot projects of arti artificial intelligence through leading digi digital technology economies countries of the world. We hope that due to this approach, millions of jobs and trillions of US in wages will be gained, which could open the door to new technologies to harness human energy, as well as uh, uh, to displacing routine jobs and increasing social inequalities, particularly in the developing countries. In this regard, government, academia, and private sector of the developing country like Pakistan are ready to play a fascinating role to run AI pilot projects regarding job shift from human to machines by digital technology leading countries through AI application. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am all for pilots in anything. I think a lot of the biometric schemes we've seen, which are evil on so many levels, would be so much better had we actually done pilots about the externalities and impacts. So I think the call for any kind of impact assessment or a pilot in this field is really warranted. I think, I don't know if others disagree, but I would really urge that before we rush off to do pilots, we also make sure that we have laws and policies that go hand in hand because pilots are often done in countries that are what I think of as low rights jurisdictions where there's sort of arbitrage around, oh, there's no data protection policy here, let's go and run this here. So I think that's something I would love to see that they, they actually trigger some sort of policy reform around those things also. Uh, thank you. Any other questions, responses? So KS, you had some more points on data that you wanted to come back to. As you, <coughs> um, as you've noticed, uh, at least um, uh, half the commentators were all going through dilemma, uh, some sort of a divide, some sort of a, a, a split in the you know, internal split in looking at how AI is being treated in their respective jurisdictions. Uh, one way uh, out of that, uh, I think, is uh, uh, looking at uh, data governance, emerging data governance in Asia. Uh, in Asian countries, uh, the data protection laws are either new or underdeveloped or are being uh, adopted right now. Uh, so we have uh, the privilege of uh, uh, reviewing and uh, sharpening the data protection law uh, so that it doesn't contribute to the buildup of uh, data silos but it contributes uh, to entering more data into the social reservoir of open data, uh, which can be fed into uh, you know, whatever AI software that uh, people will have uh, access to. Uh, in, in that regard, uh, if you look at the uh, Indian, you know, uh, Bidushi <coughs> talked about uh, IT Act, and a uh, partial, um, okay, where the noise is coming from, uh, partial data protection uh, law within IT Act. And if you look at Section 43A of uh, uh, IT Act, um, it makes exemption for uh, publicly available data. Uh, I think that allows, I, I, I I mean, what is publicly available? Yes, it is a, a contested uh, idea, uh, but uh, still, if you put it there, you know, people will uh, have a conversation about what's publicly available or, or not, but at least the discourse will be framed under that, uh, you know, the discourse will take place under that agreement so that people will freely access a, a certain amount of uh, data and will be able to uh, benefit uh, from it uh, Singapore has the same exception for publicly available data. Uh, Australia, you know, part of Asian Pacific, uh, also has a, a very uh, detailed uh, set of exemptions for uh, publicly uh, available data. Uh, I mean, privacy, the uh, boundary between private, uh, pri <coughs> private and public will change from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but by having that exemption, we can open up uh, the venue through which uh, open data can flourish, uh, allowing more people to uh, have uh, benefit from AI. 
So I think that's an opportunity there where uh, we can make sure that AI is not just viewed as uh, you know, economic development in Asia, but also uh, you know, we make sure that it delivers on its social potential as the, uh, internet, as the internet has done and as the internet should. Thank you. Um, any other questions? This one? Yes, please. And then the lady in the red at the back. This is uh, Elif Sark from IT Law Institute, Istanbul University from Turkey. I'm a research assistant. So I have two questions, and the first one is for Vidushi. You talked about how transparency doesn't really work, and most of the times transparency is a part of accountability mechanisms of algorithmic decision-making processes, let's say. And uh, yeah, I totally agree with you that transparency doesn't work, by the way, but uh, what would you replace transparency with to like build this accountability mechanism. And the second question is about integrating cultures to AI. So I'd like to share a story. Two, I think two months ago in Berlin at one of Network of Centers uh, meeting, Douglas Eck, uh, one of the co-founders of Magenta, the Google and Art um, Projects co-founder, he was there and he was talking about Magenta. And uh, one of the question was, uh, you know, like AI is taking over this like art industry, or is AI going to replace artists and what's gonna happen? It's kind of a dystopian future, let's say. And uh, he said that he defined AI as uh, art as communicating with societies. And he doesn't think that AI is going to ever like understand this c culture of society enough to communicate with it. So he doesn't believe that AI is going to replace artists because he sees AI as like a tool to make Jimi Hendrix Jimi Hendrix, like he has the guitar, he wants to invent the guitar and stuff. So how do you think culture can be integrated to AI and do you agree with him? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so I think why I say that transparency doesn't work, um, like I said during my intervention, was A, that it doesn't lead to accountability because um, systems are usually very complex. The other problem I have with it, it's usually uh, something that's post the fact. So we only ask for transparency once something has gone wrong and we want to go back and try and understand what happened. Um, so I think it would be way more useful if we shift the conversation from transparency to say scrutability. So I say you only deploy and use certain kinds of AI technologies if they are scrutable to the people using them, if you're able to um, explain them. So, and, and you can have different levels of scrutability. So for example, if I'm going to use uh, AI in the judicial system, you have to ha have a really high level of scrutability as opposed to using AI to show me what I should watch next, next on Netflix can have a lower level of scrutability. And I think it's really interesting to think of how we configure those levels as opposed to saying we want transparency. Another thing we could do is, um, so feature engineering, which I think Jake spoke about um, briefly, is the actual problem with machine learning. So uh, when it's a question of math, I think we're pretty good at it. Um, when we don't have problems with accuracy, what we do have problems with is what to look for. So we have all of this data and we need to tell the computer to optimize on X number of features. Engineering those features is often the most um, challenging part of machine learning and AI development. So I think if we start uh, building norms around what features you shouldn't use, m like protected characteristics maybe, um, that would also be useful. And, and all of this ties into a much larger point, which is I think we need to make um, AI systems scrutable by design. So it's in the process in which they're deployed as opposed to a post-fact um, accountability mechanism because then we will always fall short. Thank you. I'm conscious we have only two minutes left and rather than responding on the art point, I'd rather let these two people ask their questions so at least we can take it outside the room. Um, the lady at the back and then the gentleman here in the green. Yeah. Sorry, I think in colors. Yeah. Um, all right, well actually my question builds upon a question <laughs> that was just asked. Um, uh, it was about you know questions of fairness and accountability and remedy. Um, when you talk about scrutability of systems, uh, I think the, there's added 
um, complication when you think about what AI is being used for, for example, countering violent extremism online, when there's, you know, categories of people that you're looking for and identifying um, on, based on things that are very hard to define and are very politically sensitive. And um, the, the problem is, you know, when you use things, um, AI for things like in the judiciary system or CVE online, um, then um, it's very hard to go back after the fact, but how do you make it scrutable in the way you say by not um, using particular forms of identity or, um, you know, things that you say should be protected because that is exactly what they're looking for. And there's this blurring between the private and the public where the state is often outsourcing um, these, these functions to private companies who are then not under the same obligations for accountability and remedy than the state is. Um, so I guess it's just um, a question about the complexity of this question of remedy and going back um, and uh, yeah, getting some sort of uh, redress for anything that goes wrong. Also when, um, in terms of machine learning, surely it's quite hard to find out what has gone wrong. And often companies don't know how to go back and say what exactly went wrong. Thank you. Those are all really important points. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about predictive policing, but I think that's, again, a really big question in this space about whether the past can dictate the future and whether you can always say people who once did something will do the same thing again. Um, and I think it raises these questions of public and private as well about who is policing and who's accountable and what rights we have against one or other of them, which might be different, oh. r certain rights against the state versus private companies, as Idushi was also saying. Um, and the last question here, you can have the last word. Okay, okay very, very short. I used to work in the field of AI, unfortunately, 30 years ago. And the aim at that time was much more in the fight of design, supporting designers, or to make things much more smart, uh, like thanks to fuzzy logic and similar things. Nowadays, it seems that the, uh, the vision in the future of such kind of AI is much more the creation of some part of the universe is not in the same meaning the lady from Malaysia told, but uh, universes created according with the profile that is tailored by big companies or by governments or by opinion leaders in, in the way each of the person will live in specific ad hoc created universe. And this is a little bit of a dystopian vision of the future. It's, I mean, it's, it's already uh, working this methodology if you consider uh, the use of search engines that is tailored according to your taste, your uh, behavior, and other things, you receive completely different feedbacks if you check the same, you put the same query on different computers. And this is uh, a little bit concerning me. So m my optimistic vision is about the opportunity to take the control about the system or have the choice to decide which kind of future, which kind of, which kind of choices, which kind of decision we can take without a kind of big brother due to AI piloted by someone else. That's all. Thank you. Um, I think one person's personalization is another person's big brother, and that's again another dichotomy we come up with. Thank you all for being here, and I hope we've given you a small flavor of what's similar, what's different in the way we talk about these things in Asia, and stay in touch with all of us. Um, thanks very much. Bye. Oh, it's rising. Yeah, look at both of us. It's rising. <laughs> this is from Bambi.